and we're live one second before we're supposed to be live i hope everybody's okay with that <laughs> i'm known in certain circles as last minute lance i you know this is last second lance so you're <laughs> you're growing up kid all right hi lance how you doing hey matt welcome home uh do i look tan you do I am. I saw the sun for the first time in a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and it was good, wasn't it? It was good. Where'd you go? Uh, places. I went to Joshua Tree. Um, and I went to Kanab, Utah, to the Night Skippers Conference. And I went to lots of fun places in the Grand Staircase in the Vermilion Cliffs area, including a, a dream trip, an overnight in White Pocket. And uh, also, you know, another place, too. And I got to spend all that time with Gabe. <laughs> it was wonderful. Yeah. Right. yeah. So sorry there hasn't been blog chat, but boy, the Internet was not good out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I am sure Steve missed us. He, Steve definitely did. <laughs> He's always the first to comment. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Uh, we're going to show that right now. Steve always drops his rat emoji, MrRat.com. And uh, thank you. It's good to see you, Steve. Thanks for being here with us. Indeed. So, Lance, you wrote another humdinger uh, of a look into the past, into one of the muses that has informed your visual choices. Your series, mm -hmm. The Muses from the Past, is is celebrated. I know a lot of people love it, and they eagerly look forward to the next one, including myself. Even if I just admitted to you, I haven't read this one yet, which I <laughs> well, shouldn't do in public. You were in Kanab and I, Joshua I Tree and White I was, Pocket. I was doing stuff with things elsewhere. Were you eating Hot Pockets in White Pocket? <laughs> Far from it, man. <laughs> Far from it. Although the food was pretty good. You know, we, we went in there with action tours, so um, the action photo tours. They... They took care of us. It was a nice little camping, taking care of experience. So, Cool. Well, yep. I have a feeling we'll be hearing more about that part of the country before too long. I hope so. Cool. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, it's a blog post. Well, you know, you, you said that has informed my, my uh, aesthetic. I don't know. I, I don't remember exactly what you said. But... Um, yeah, you know, I I always have been a a fan and a student of of history, and I've always enjoyed looking at the work of that other people have done. Um, this guy, um, Alfonso Garcia Sanchez, and his two sons uh, were not someone that I would have encountered on my own ever. Um, when I was writing my first book um, and doing research on the history of night photography and uh, communicating with a lot of people, um, uh, specifically in this case, a guy named Alan Griffiths, who runs a site called Luminous Lint, which is a weird name for a photography site, but it is a... Uh, it's a compendium or an encyclopedia or a wiki of photographers uh, through the ages. And Alan it was very generous with his time and, and his uh, uh, knowledge, which he shared with me. And, and he turned me on um, to this fellow in Madrid, which... I'm totally blanking out on his name right now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Gerard, Gerardo Kurtz. He is Gerardo a okay. German American who whose parents took him to Madrid. I think they were diplomats. They took him to Madrid in the early 1960s and he grew up there and has lived there as pretty much uh, ever since. But his and I, I forgot his name because it was nine years ago when I had this conversation. It was an extended email conversation over several months with him um, about Alfonso Garcia Sanchez and Spanish post-war night photography. Pretty, uh, you know, there are not too many people who can converse 
on a topic like that, right? No, not me. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So he introduced me to to Sanchez, and in particular, the the project, the the subject of this week's or last week's blog post, Rincones del Viejo Madrid, mm -hmm. or um, Corners of Old Madrid. And this book is really pretty, pretty fascinating. And um, he told me all about it. I tried to find one at the time and it, you know, couldn't. Um, Alan Griffiths at Luminous Lint had some of the images that Gerardo had scanned from his copy of the book in Madrid and sent to Luminous Lint. And then I was able to find a copy of this at the library at the uh, University of Texas, Austin, Harry Ransom Photo Center. It was a great museum there and got to, um, uh, I was also, I went there and I was communicating with the curator there, Roy Flukinger, about uh, another night photographer, Paul Martin, who he, Roy had written a book about. Anyway, it just so happened that they had a copy there at, um, Harry Ransom Center of, of this book. So I got to see the original one. And then just, um, you know, when we wrote the last blog post about, uh, you know, 10 more bo essential books for your night photography collection, yeah. I got to thinking about this one again and the conversation that I had with Gerardo and, and how interesting it was. And so I started looking around online to see if I could find a copy. and. Um, there's another book of the same name that has nothing to do with this one that kept popping up over and over and again. But um, lo and behold, there was a, a bookseller, um, I think in Connecticut, that had a copy of this book. It was published in 1951 or 52 mm -hmm. in Spain, primarily as a propaganda piece to, to build Spain up and make it look, in particular Madrid, make it look like a safe and inviting place uh, to visit. No kidding. Yeah. That's the, cool. whole, the whole thing is a very elaborate and very expensive propaganda piece. Art as propaganda? No, perish the yeah, yeah, how about that? Uh, but government propaganda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this the converse, going back to my conversation with Gerardo Kurtz, it was about the politics of post-war Spain and Franco's the Franco government's uh, efforts to polish up their image and kind of rejoin the world. Um, you know, sp Spain was basically a semi-fascist dictatorship under Franco. And during the war, they offic Spain officially remained neutral, but they more or less supported the access powers underhandedly and, and, and backhandedly. And um, so anyway, they, they were really isolated. They wanted to be accepted and, and become a part of the brand new United Nations that was formed after World War II. Mm. So they were... And there were a new group of, um, I don't know, chattering technocrats that were whispering in Franco's ear and kind of slowly bringing him around to the fact that Spain was in deep trouble if they didn't, if they didn't, you know, become a, a world citizen again. So anyway, roundabout story here. One of the brilliant ideas, and I say brilliant ideas, air quotes there, that they came up with was to produce a book of night photographs of London, uh, the old oldest part of London, which was the Moorish Quarter that had been what was left of the Arabic part of Madrid before the Spaniards came and, and took over. Uh, very bizarre. And the thing that makes it even stranger is that the images are, you know, any, almost any one of them, you know, the caption could be, it was a dark and stormy night. You know, 
not something that says, right. "Hey, happy Taurus, come and check me out." You know, right. <laughs> they're 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 moody. They're you know they're all the things that we love about night images. They're right. you know they're 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 dark and mysterious and deep shadows and and gloomy and spooky and all that. Lots of atmosphere, but they're not rest necessarily saying, "Hey." Tourist, come on down here. I got yeah. something to show you. <laughs> it's safe to walk down this dark and shadowy alley at night. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's really an unusual uh, project. Um, it was, and it's not like, you know, a cheaply printed mass market paperback. Right. This, it's, it's bound, uh, case bound in goat leather with gold foil stamping on here. Uh, the end papers are, let me see, my lighting is a bit harsh here, marbled, Italian marbled paper. And this paper, it's it's not a printed pattern. Uh, if you, uh, I only know about paper marbling because I used to do book binding. I've seen it being made. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, right? Yes. You know, you've got bits of ink swirling and floating on water that the paper yep. is dipped and pulled through it and yep. let to dry. Yeah, so it's pretty uh, pretty elaborate. And then there's basically 40 or 41 images in here. And each image, here, let me, I'm going to start. Each image has its own title page uh -huh. with a, a, a drawing, yep. a very official looking drawing. Wow. And then the, the name of the location where it was made, La Plaza Imperial de la Villa, okay. in this case. So then you turn the page, and you have the image. And there's, there's our image. Oh, wow. And it's very unusual. There's about a half a dozen of them that have snow. Amazing. In Madrid, it's not a place you really think of as a snowy place. Oh, and then, of course, let me show you the other page here. Um, the caption describing the page in both Spanish and here's where they skimped. You know, this oh. is really where they skimped on this project. The translator they got, he not, not so speak good English. Okay. Um, okay. Did you clean those up for the blog post? Or no. No. No, and it really okay. upset Chris, too. <laughs> <laughs> so in the blog post, the images from this book have the English transcriptions of the captions. And let's let's scroll down to, uh, I think it's the last one. The last image. Uh, yeah, the last image. Um. All right, so I'm going to, while we're looking at this image, I'm going to read the caption here. And again, this is direct from Spanish here. Calle de Royo. The lower part of the street at the back of the Conde de, la, de Rivia Giguedo, sorry, was named Calle de la Parra, also known as Vine Street. It was famous in the time of the master Juan Lopez, professor of studies in the town. He was fined for not hindering or punishing his pupils who stole the grapes from a vine. Vexed because of the fines and warnings, he kept in prison for three days Miguel de Cervantes, who was the perpetrator of scaling the walls and stealing the grapes. What kind of sentence is that? <laughs> I want that, that um, evokes a time and a place, some feelings and emotions, and not necessarily clarity. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not exactly clarity. Um, it, it's uh, it's just a literal word for word translation. There was no attempt made to or ability, I guess, to uh, to translate the, the thoughts behind the sentences. It's just a, I'm just going to consider it poetry. Let's talk about the photography. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Well, one, one more last thought on, on this thing. And that, now I, I said that Chris was upset that we were using these captions and we we're trying to figure out a way to, <laughs> to show that this was not our bad writing uh -huh. or my bad writing. 
Um, and the reason being, when you look at this in a browser window, you see the image and then you see the caption below it. But if you're looking at this on a mobile device, the text in the captions is indistinguishable from the text in the body of the thing. So it just looks like part of the, the post. Right. And um, the, the, the funniest thing of all was that Chris read through it um, and he was very diplomatically trying to tell me that um, I should rewrite my captions because they weren't, weren't very good. Mm. And I'm like, Chris, I cannot believe you thought I actually wrote that garbage. <laughs> because, you know, whenever he, whenever Chris is in a jam and he needs a blog post in a hurry, he'll kind of butter me up a little bit and, and say, you know, you know, your, your writing is, is really easy to edit. I don't have to do many changes for it. So, you know, it would really help me out if you could kind of pull a blog post together on the fly because you're really easy to edit. So, yeah, Chris, you say that to all the girls. Enjoy your look behind the curtains here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> this is well, called blog chat. So yeah, we're chatting about the blog. Anything could be said. <laughs> yeah, well, I wonder if Chris now I know Chris is not watching because he's doing Lightroom Live right now. So we're safe on that one. <laughs> yeah, for now. For now. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about these images a little bit. Cause because they're pretty interesting. Let's go back up and take a look at the first one, Matt, if we if we yeah. may. Yes, sir. Uh, Not this one. Yeah, we can skip over that for now. Maybe okay. if we have maybe if we have time, we'll talk about that. But okay, let's talk about Mr. Sanchez's images. Okay. Now, um, he was not widely known for night photography, and it's not. And he was, he's also, he's, he was one of the more important mid-century Spanish photographers, primarily as a commercial photographer, uh, had a big studio, did a lot of advertising, commercial photography, um, and not sure how he was chosen for this project uh, or what, you know, we'll never know what guidelines or restrictions or limitations, what, you know, what his instructions were. But the images that he came back with, I, I you know, most of them are, the, I think this is the best one in the book that we're starting with, but most of them are fairly ordinary scenes um, without a tremendous amount of creativity, but they are really well executed. There are many of them show these gas streetlights. Wait, I just want to say that's exactly what I want people to remember me at. Like, it's like, just, it was technically executed well. I'll be happy <laughs> if, if, if I pass into the shuffle off this mortal coil of people saying that about me. <laughs> okay, please continue. <laughs> All right. Um, gas so during, during World War II, um, there was were some significant advances in photographic technology, both in optics and in films and chemistry. And this was, of course, out of the need for espionage photography, mostly aerial photography, so they could figure out where to, where they wanted to drop the bombs. But the, the side effect was uh, when the war was over, there were better lenses and better films. Um, and... Garcia Sanchez here took advantage of that for this project. So the most remarkable thing about all of these images is the extreme, con fantastic control of the highlights in the extremely contrasty scenes. Mm -hmm. Many of these scenes, you can even see the little gas bags in the gas lights. Yeah. Um, there's virtually no blown highlights anywhere. Um, oh, yeah, I it didn't. Must have been I didn't dodging a lot. Yeah, but he was also he also clearly did his did his homework yeah, yeah. and did some studying on the development exposure and development combination. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as somebody who did my own black and developed my own black and white night photography system over a 20 year period and, and working with this particular problem 
to control blown highlights and still have details in the shadows. I know that he was really knew what he was doing and he had absolute control over his process. Mm -hmm. So no, it was cool. Um, just an aside here back, you know, talking, we're talking about the, the book again. Um, one thing I didn't mention before was, you know, I said it's, it's got bound in goat leather and has Italian marbled papers and all that. It's also printed in photogravure, which is a much more, expensive process than just traditional offset printing, oh. which means that the image quality is outstanding. Wow. Um, so there, there have been, you know, just a few photography books that were printed in gravure. Brassais, Paris de Nuit in, in uh, 1932, um, Burdekin and Morrison's London Night a year later. And those are, you know, really some of the most exquisite uh, night photography books ever. So, um, you know, if anybody knows photographers now who are doing photogravure process, um, you know, they're, they, the prints sell for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Uh, it's a very finicky, delicate process. Um, it's ink and a plate. Uh, so it's, it's not, um, it's just, an, you know, it's another process that there aren't any books that are printed with photogravure anymore. It's, it's not economically possible. Anyway, so that was uh, that was my thought on, on his images. It's more about uh, a technical accomplishment <laughs> than a creative one, I think. Um, and interestingly he didn't seem to go on and do night photography after this, even after he figured this out and spent however much time he did uh, working on this project, he didn't go back and do night photography on his own. So um, yeah. All right. So this one is Cahier de Cordon, Del Cordon, uh, the most felicitous hits of portraying the night in the venerable nooks in old Madrid. Obviously, again, reading from the caption there. The narrowness of the streets causes the buildings to look higher and wade deeper down with mystery. It seems as if a curtain were raised behind which we perceive the decoration of fairy tales of legend and adventure. You know, that's a lot more poetic, romantic. It, it is. And, and it's, it's definitely, that was the intention. And I'm sure in the original Spanish, mm. It sounds very mellifluous. Mellifluous. Uh, mellifluous. <laughs> there yeah. it is. But um, in this case, it just sounds clunky. So, okay. I love how he controlled the highlights in this shot, too. And like the silhouette of the gas lantern there, like the one in the sky and the one down yeah. there. It's just, yeah. It's I just say, I look at this image and I say, yeah. Yep. Yeah. The, I, I agree. Uh, you know, of course, I I picked out what I thought were the most interesting and best photos in the book for the blog post, for sure. Mm. There are, you know, there, there are plenty of them that are are less interesting, but, you know, that's okay. okay. It was a commercial job, right? He's just like, he's it's a hack. A job. Done. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's just like, I got to go make these night pictures for this book because, you know, they got to get people to come here and or what, that's what they wanted, right? Tourism? Yeah. Okay. Well, they were, they were looking for tourism, but they they were also looking to you know um, looking to come out of isolation, right? And, oh, and the, that, that's a topic I can I empathize with. Yeah, right. Can't we all? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's what a timely uh, blog post. In indeed. Um, all right. So this one, the uh, Calle de Codo. Uh, ba, 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 what can we say specifically about this one? Um, well, you know, really nice highlight control. Again, it's a little bit hot in the doorway, um, you know, right in the middle of the frame. Yeah. But uh, the gas lights are uh, not, you know, not overly blown out. And notice, like all uh, good urban night photographers, a lot of these images are made on rainy nights with mm. wet pavement to mm. reflect 
Um, and you can also, you can just barely make out the silhouette of somebody sitting on the ground in the lower right corner here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's it like a homeless me. person sitting there like, oh yeah, here, come here, Taurus. Give me a, give me a peso. Peseta. Sorry. Peseta, not a peso. Oh yeah. Um, right. And this one, the uh, San Pedro El Viejo, Bajo de la Escarcha de Enero. Obviously, my Spanish sucks, but I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this we're losing a little bit on the uh, online reproduction here, but uh, it looks like moonlight on the on the roof tiles. Yes, definitely. Yeah, there's, there's definitely moonlight in there. There are a lot of deep shadows, and the um, the photogravure um, uh, process does obscure some some uh, shadow detail. Excuse me, one second. Sure. Let me for a second, Matt. I'll be right back. Hi, this is Matt, and I'm here to talk to you about national parks at night. Okay, Lance is back. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the. This is for uh, Rext comment there. Sorry, I'm trying to. Get I was going to show that in a moment. Here we go. So yeah. Rext asked, "Have you seen Washington by Night by Come on, camera. Wenzel, published in the '40s?" So I guess the answer is yes. That's a yes, Lance. Um, yeah, and we actually have a blog post about this guy and his work as well. I don't care. Another muse from the past. Oh, sweet. So. Since it came up, I you know I can't. It it, it yes, uh, San yes, Pedro yes. El Viejo is a church carol. Sorry, I got distracted again. The Church of but, San Pedro the Old with its proud tower. Yes, yep. very proud tower. Um, a, a diversion about Washington by night. Uh huh. Um, Volkmar Wenzel was a darkroom technician for National Geographic in the 1930s mm. and he was in he got a copy of Brassai's Paris de Nuit mm. and was inspired by it who, wouldn't, who be? wouldn't be right yeah so he went out and photographed Washington DC where he was based for National Geographic uh, at night in the 36 37 38 this work was eventually, and and he stayed with National Geographic for a long time, and eventually became a photographer for the magazine. And this work was published in National Geographic in 1941 or 42, and and somewhere I've got actually, of course, the original National Geographic with the with the images in it. The book was published in the early 90s, um, 92, I think. And this one is available uh, on from used booksellers, either on Amazon or or ABE Books, uh, and it's very reasonably priced. You can pick up a copy of this for ten or fifteen bucks. I definitely worth it. The uh, he wasn't saying cool. He was just saying cool that we we talked about it. So I thought it was a good time to put this up. You know. So. <laughs> um, Rincones del Viejo Madrid, on the other hand, is a lot harder to find and a lot more expensive, understandably. So, yeah. but Gabe, after <laughs> after hearing me talk about this one, did go out and seek out a, a copy and and found it. So, um, and if any of you guys who read our blog on a regular basis will know that uh, Gabe and I have a friendly competition going for who can fill more bookshelves with with night photography books. Very friendly competition, but I'm winning. Oh wow, <laughs> wow! Are you are you measuring that by pounds or titles? Uh, linear feet. Linear feet. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. I guess I don't like, know what I don't know what measurement scale he's using, but I'm using <laughs> linear feet. Well, if you're not playing by the same rules, I mean. <laughs> Hey, we got to the end of the images there. Do you have any other images that you wanted to talk about from the post? Well, sure. Let's, why not? Um, since we've only been going at this for, for uh, half an hour and we you got to give people what they on. paid for, right? That's right. How about this one? All right. So, yeah. So the whole idea 
about this when when I came back across my email conversation with with Gerardo, um, and reading through those uh, those messages, and he was talking about you know work that the project was work for hire, um, and not a not a passion project. It got it got me thinking back to when I had just gotten out of school, I went to the Academy of Art in San Francisco. Um, I knew that I wanted to do night photography and I was trying to find a way where I could do night photography and get paid. Mm. Um, you know, when you're, when you're just starting out, you, you take what assignments you can get, but you're looking for, you know, a particular thing. Um, and I, you know, I was going after architectural assignments because that at the time that was the most likely opportunity to be able to do anything resembling night photography. It's typically twilight when you have the ambient light balanced with the interior lights yeah. of a building and you're yeah. shooting in the, you know, exteriors. Of course, the assignments I were getting were like, you know, institutional renovations of libraries and cafeterias. So not, not too glamorous. But um, one of the guys that I went to school with there was, was Tom Pava. Um, you know, people know Troy Pava for his Lost America abandoned uh, work. But his older brother, Tom, is also a night photographer. And, and we've been buddies back since the late 1980s. And, and why well, I bring Tom up because... Well, actually, I, I shot with him at this location, the Port of Stockton, a couple of times. But also, more than just about anybody else I know, he was an amazing or is an amazing hustler mm. in terms of getting assignments, self-assignments. Mm. He just went out and if he saw something he wanted to photograph, he approached it from every angle until he found the person that he really needed to talk to to get permission to get in and photograph. And then he would just shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And then when he had work that he liked, then plan the next step of the plan would, would come in and he'd figure out who he needed to show those images to in order to get them to buy them. So rather rather than- So clever. You know, yeah. What would you say? So clever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, rather than just look for assignments that were already existing. He makes his own assignments, the self-assigned projects, and then he convinces people that they need to buy them. Um, so so I, I took my inspiration from him and, and uh, for this particular project, driving up and down uh, Interstate 5 in California and going past the Port of Stockton facility and seeing all these weird industrial buildings and mm -hmm. heavy equipment, it's like, Ooh, that's kind of calling to me. Yeah, and uh, that's really where I started with all of my interest in night photography was with industrial sites mm. and just the weirdness and the strangeness of the the architecture and the lighting. Anyway, um, I snuck in here, got kicked out, made some phone calls, and <laughs> and sent some email. No, I wasn't sending emails because it was 1992. Sent some faxes, <laughs> maybe some faxes, but. <laughs> Uh, actually, you know, I, th I think I might have gone and, and met with the marketing director in, in person. And anyway, she eventually gave me permission to go in and photograph this site. And I went there with Tom a number of times and, and a few other people. Um, and it was it was glorious. It was fun. It was heaven. And it almost became the biggest uh, assignment that I'd had to date. The the marketing director, and this is the like a small agricultural port in a small city of interior California. This is not like big city ad agency type marketing director. This is a you know a woman who grew up in in farm country and and she loved the images, and she wanted to put them used like a half a dozen of them in the annual report. Yes. You know, totally psyched. That was amazing. Yeah. It would have been just, the, you know, so cool. Um, so she passed. I, I send her some prints and she shows them to the, the port, the director of the port. And this is like immediately like, no, I mean, there's a nice photographs, but it's not going to work. 
I'm like, what do you mean it's not going to work? What? I, you know, it's like crushed. And, you know, the goal of the, mar the annual report is to show this place as a thriving, vibrant, busy facility with lots of buzzing activity and right. tons of, and, of product moving through there every day. Not beautiful and empty. You know, yeah, just kind of like the, the uh, abandoned corners of old Madrid. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So the the arc, the marketing director for Franco was didn't pass the images on to somebody who knew better. I see and, why you know, I see why you opened the post with that. There's there's a definite definite correlation between the two. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, you know, in in my case, you know, the images weren't published because they weren't appropriate to the to the subject. Um, in in Garcia Sanchez's case, um, you know they were beautiful images, but they were not. They they didn't really meet the serve the purpose. And you know, I don't think too many American tourists came to Spain as a result of this book, if they have even saw it. Right. Right. So reissue it, revive the photographer gravure. How do you say that? Photo photo photographer process photographer process photographer process yes yeah. i can't say it and i always thought i could i've read the word thousands of times but i don't think i've ever uttered it did you ever have that happen <laughs> there it is there's there those is. notifications i told you i don't care about them. yeah <laughs> anywho um but any just to bring it back around i only put this one in here because of that you know, that was my thinking when I got to writing this this post. But, you know, I, I want to say to our, our viewers out there, um, you know, the longer that you photograph, the more, hopefully, you know, the more you will develop your own, your own vision, your own idea of what you want to photograph, what you love to photograph, uh, what's important to you. And like, you know, like Tom, just go out and do it. And you may have ambitions to to get other people to, you know, to see them, to buy them, to show them, to exhibit your work, whatever. But you got to do what you love. You really don't be don't be a hack and shoot stuff just because it's a paying gig. You know, don't like. Imagine if if National Parks at Night guys went out and were wedding photographers on the on our off days, we wouldn't be very good wedding photographers, with the exception of Matt, of course. Right? I did it once and I swore off of it. Never again. <laughs> That's like most of us. Just once. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, do do what this guy did. You know, look at the work of some of other people whose work you admire, and then go out and and do it your way and make it your own. And you'll be successful at it. I mean, this guy went, Wenzel went, Wenzel, if we're talking German, went from a dark guy who was processing film in the lab at National Geographic to one of their main photographers in the 1940s and 50s. So that's more power to you. And 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 my buddy Tom, who's had such amazing success. I got to grab one more book. With his <laughs> And now I'm going to sing the Jeopardy song. And this is not the Jeopardy song because Lance is grabbing another book. Okay. So I, t I told you about Tom's self-assigned product projects. Um, biggest one he ever did and literally big. Look at the size of this book. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. This is an 11 by 17 hardbound book. Um and this was, these are photographs of the San Francisco, the new section of the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Um, he worked for six months just to get access to shoot the, the site um, and then shot it for the entire construction over a three year period. Wow. And all in four by five. Wow. Day and night. Took the work to Nazareli Press, which is one of the most prestigious publishers of photography books, and convinced them to to print it. A guy, a, a commercial photographer who was not 
you know, widely known in the art world. Mm -hmm. They made this, you know, like $50,000 investment in his work to, to publish this book. Wow. Under the conditions that Tom had to pre-sell 600 books. Did he? He did. That's one amazing. of the of one did. of the contractors building the the bridge agreed to buy the book and use it as a promotional piece for their business. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. That's awesome. So, I mean, there are ways to do what you do, do what you love to do and get paid for it as we're lucky enough to do ourselves. Here, here. Well said. So I feel very fortunate to, uh, to be here and, and where, where I am in, in my career and working with, with you guys at National Parks at Night. Kind of end up every, every blog chat saying the same thing. And I guess it's a good thing, right? You know what? It's a better story than I hate this and I don't want to be here. <laughs> Which is what I would be saying if I had to shoot a wedding this weekend. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> No, if if I was going to shoot a wedding, I might as well be a UPS driver. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably rather be. I would rather be a UPS driver than a wedding photographer. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Well, those are great words, great thoughts, Lance. Thank you, thank you. This is this is a great time for people to to think about, you know, gratitude. Um, it seems like in some places things are just getting better. Um, and there's a lot to look forward to. And if you hold that gratitude with you as you go forward into this, um, then you're more likely to enjoy what's to come even more. So, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so Rex has a really interesting question. I think, uh, who are the emerging people now in night photography? Hmm. Do you have your eye on that? Well, um, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm working on another blog post right now of recently published night photography books. And um, one that I just came across uh, today that I wasn't familiar with it is a guy named Liam Wong. Yeah, Liam Wong, uh, who is a game designer, a Scottish... Chinese game designer who's been uh, enraptured with Tokyo, fell in love with Tokyo, going there on, on his game design business and has been doing some night street mm. life photographs of Tokyo. Mm. Right, right. Um, but to, to more directly answer Rex's question, this is a weird and different time than we've ever experienced before in the world of photography. You know, mm. um, 30 some years ago when I got into photography, you know, you could hold up the the giants of night photography in, you know, a small stack of books. Right. Um, you know, they were all white men and there's still a lot of them out there, but um, the history, you know, has just, was was written and slowly built up momentum over 150 years but now we're to the point where you know everybody's a photographer right yeah and the world is 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 changed so much and night night photography has gone from being this obscure thing that people say you can't do that it doesn't work cuz there's no light out to like Oh yeah, let me get my phone out and take a picture of you know this moonlit landscape. So I don't, I don't know. Um, you know I don't, I don't. I think the the art world is changing. The art market is evaporating, except for the blue chip, established blue chip artists and a few up and coming new people. I don't know. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's so many people doing amazing work that are unrecognized or barely recognized because of the love, the number, the sheer volume of images and, and people producing images. Right. Um, you know, before social media, 
uh, you had to go. You actually had to go to a gallery or a museum to see photography. Mm -hmm. right. It was more social. Photography was both antisocial and social. Right, and you know now you just scroll through your Instagram feed, and Which who's the up and coming photographer? Just I don't know. Take a look on on there and see who has the most followers. It's both antisocial and social at the same time, but in a different way. Um, I I think Rex has a really interesting question. Um, if you're asking who's emerging now, um, I I I could drop some names of people that that I really. Uh, I enjoy being inspired by, um, but I, I just want to, I would lay ground rules on that. I think Lance's upcoming post about like some current books is really going to um, uh, contemporary photographers is going to be an interesting one, but like there's, there's a really interesting discussion there about uh, attention. And that's really what social media is about is attention. Mm. We're using social media right now and we have your attention. So we'll get meta for a moment, right? Um, and perhaps, perhaps you weren't asking us to to reach as deeply as I am right now. You know, you just wanted to know who who do we have our eyeballs on. Um, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna say a couple of things. Like, there's people who understand how to get attention and use um, use the vehicles of t today, the modern vehicles, and to get attention. And they use certain signals, certain kinds of photography that have certain contrasts, that have certain focus, that have certain colors to gain attention. And that might not qualify as emerging. You know, that might be qualify as somebody who's very good at using a network to get attention. Um, so it's, there's a, there's a lot of thought that should go into the answer, uh, in my opinion, of careful thought of like, who is advancing the state of the art? Who's causing people to think more deeply rather than who's getting the most engagement or likes or shares or attention? Um, so I, I think there's, there's an interesting discussion that we should probably uh, talk about. And we'll probably have that as a panel discussion or something or some more, some more thoughtful things. But we do, we do consume a lot of photography too perhaps on Instagram, like you do, you know? So, um, my, my feelings is, you know, like there, there is one confident person in the audience and that's Steve. Steve said me, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, your photography is delicious. Just got to say that. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, I don't, I don't think like in this broadcast, I'm prepared to drop any names. Um, but there's, uh, there's some thinking to be done, you know, like I'd mm -hmm. like to know if there's people that, that you have seen Rex that, that you uh, thought were stimulating, you know, or what your criteria are for, for somebody that, that stimulates you and, and doesn't just grab your attention. And I make that distinction, you know, uh, how long do they, do you think about them after you've seen their photographs? Right. Or do you only remember them after you see their, their pictures slide by on social media? Um, and that's and that's the social media game is you have to keep posting to be to keep attention, you know, to stay yeah. in somebody's mind, and it, it turns into a hamster wheel. Night photography is not a hamster wheel, so it's like it's antithetical, like it's it's against pretty much what night photography does, which is to slow down, take your time, put more time into one photograph, you know, um, and it's. It's fascinating that we all have these platforms to share it on. Um, so I guess I'll step off my soapbox for a second, but that's where my mind is at when I think about who's emerging. It's like, I need to tell myself, don't just get distracted by people who are talented at getting your attention, you know, because yeah. it's easy to get distracted by that. Indeed. Sage words there, Matt. Sorry, I didn't mean to be a downer. But <laughs> no, I, no, not at all. I, I think it's incredibly insightful. Okay. Um, and and definitely gives us all something to to think about. Yeah, but uh, in the comments, please, if you guys are watching this now, you're watching in the future. If you wanted to to tell us what what criteria you use, you know, to to say, um, find somebody who has stimulated you and has made you think differently about your work. I think that's a really good discussion discussion to have in the comments. Let's do that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there really are so many people doing amazing work, but it's True. difficult to filter it out 
And, you know, that, that question, the way that, you know, the way I perceived Rex's question was showing my old school nature that thinking about emerging in, in the, the sense of, you know, being recognized by the photography art world, you mm-hmm. know, getting, you know, and as, which is very different from getting a lot of attention on social media. And that, so that. Right. Yeah. I, we got a couple of replies from Rex feeding the 10,000 followers versus telling stories. And that's really interesting. There's stories. They're a literal part of Instagram, you know, like that's the stories. <laughs> so they, they named it that way for a reason. Right. Um, and taking pictures that are verbs instead of nouns. That's a thinker right there. <laughs> that's a thinker. Yeah. yeah I, I just, I want to echo what you're saying, Lance. Um, there is a ton of really interesting things being done out there. Um, I wrote myself a note while we were at the Nightscaper conference. That it, it just it was a thread that was woven throughout all of the 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 the, uh, the lectures that I attended. But this is a note to myself that it should be no surprise. Technology advances the state of the art, and photography is is a perfect example of this. Every time something new comes out in photography, people rush to embrace it the quote unquote rules change, the aesthetics change, the because the possibilities become different and broader or deeper, uh, especially night photography is a perfect example of this, is that technology yeah. has advanced the state of the art. And it's gonna continue to do that. And we have to we have to we have to adapt with it. We need to, to understand how we can make more vision out of it, not just use the technology. So it's fun though. It's super fun. I don't want to get too hyper intellectual about this. Night photography is damn fun. We should continue having fun with it. Uh, And also put a little thought into why we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I want to make my, my last uh, comment on, on the subject. Um, You know, you got me thinking about, one of my favorite night photographers who's somebody who's, who's definitely not emerging, but, uh, you know, Steve, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, I, I think, Love you know, you, his, um, you know, he's maybe had 14 and three quarter minutes so far and, and everything that's happened in the world is, is, uh, you know, drowning out his work, but, but, um, you know, Michael Kenna is mm-hmm. somebody who I've watched his work as long as I've been photographing. And what he's the opposite of what you just said, Matt, about embracing new technology, in that he has followed his own vision singularly um, using the materials and the techniques that he knows that he's developed over, you know, decades right. um, and doesn't, and he's, he, he's very good at filtering out all of the noise and just does what he wants to do. And for many, many years was very, very successful no. at that. And there were, you know, many, many people who were, uh, you know, copying his his style very quite quite literally for a long time but uh Mm. and that that's something that i i've always admired is just you know finding your own way in the dark right hey somebody wrote a book with that title some somebody did yeah oh that was you oh oh yeah for, you know, for a second, I thought it sounded familiar, and then I'm like, "Wait a second, that is Lance's book." <laughs> that was that was a moment there. So, oh geez, um, <laughs> yeah, I was on the but, road. Forgive me. Yeah. But there's there's really something to be said for both aspects, both you know, exploring new possibilities and new technologies, but also staying focused to what's true to yourself, your own vision and, and not getting distracted by, you know, not feeling the need to go out and buy the latest and greatest camera or download the latest and greatest app. Um, but at the same time to push yourself to make 
more images that still excite you. Yeah. And that's that's harder to do if you're not, um, you know, pursuing all the the latest technology. So. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's a strange balance there between being enabled by technology or technology, not having the technology to try and achieve the things that you want. But I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in boundaries helping you. You know, like if you can't do something, you'll find an inventive way to do it anyway. Hmm. Yeah. So, hmm. And that's something that you're certainly good at, very good at. Yeah, I, I also am, am a technology hound. So, like, I, I do enjoy having boundaries, but at the same time, I pursue technology pretty passionately. So, yeah. yeah. Both the, the physical and the um, whatever you would describe, however <laughs> you describe software aspect of it. Bits and bytes, binary. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I, I gosh, I'm like I don't know. My my latest passion, and I, I tried out a whole bunch of things over this last trip. But all out of all the things that I tried out over this last trip, my latest latest thing that I'm totally infatuated with is multi row panoramas. Panoramas. Like I, I would love to see you incorporate that into your previous latest passion, macro. <laughs> so. Multi-row macro panoramas. <laughs> All you need I is like. a X, Y, you know, uh, that's funny. I, I I almost had time. I did like three or four macro shots while I was out there. The problem with macro in the field is this, folks. The secret is everything moves when you're outside. It sucks. The wind is always there until it, like when you want to do macro. Guess what? The wind is always blowing. So end of story. So get two focusing racks. You can do X, Y. You could definitely do pano stitching with macro and focus stacking. It's totally doable. Better in a studio, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Woo. Yes, at night. <laughs> okay, we're off the rails, folks. Here yes. we go. Let's go Let's, get some dinner. Let's, thank you for a thought provoking blog post. Thank you for provoking some thoughts. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. And the royal, the royal me just said that. Our pleasure. <laughs> um, oh, boy. Yeah, th I think I need to go have a drink now. Um, thank you to everybody for being patient while we took a couple of weeks Here, off. You want to sip? Oh, thank you so much. No, it, I can't pass I it to you. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, wrong side. Oh, there it is. <laughs> it's just the wrong thing is coming out. Oh, that's not it. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm going to try pun. <laughs> yeah, they're behind me. Nice bokeh on those tripods. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we took a couple of weeks off, but again, the, the internet was kind of weird there. So, um, uh, yeah, we've we've had we've had time to think, we've had time to do. I just want to say it's um, in a few hours, many of you could be shooting the the total lunar eclipse or the partial lunar eclipse, depending on where you are. You know, so have fun shooting tonight. Uh, we saw somebody check in earlier. I think that was Julianne headed out to Joshua Tree to stake her her spot to yeah. go shoot it. There we go. And thanks again. She, she also mentioned that um, we had back to back workshops in Joshua Tree National Park. Gabe and I held the first one, which is a passport workshop. And then on the heels of that. Tim and Chris came in to do our very first photo pills workshop. And from everything I heard, rave reviews from the students. They, everybody had a great time. There will be more photo pills in our future. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah. love photo. Thanks, Rafi. Hey, I see uh, I see Hadley's in the crowd. Um, Hadley, are you going out to shoot the uh, the eclipse? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? I was just clicking on his, his name. There we go. Thank you, Hadley. Thank you, indeed. I'm um, looking forward to seeing you in Sequoia later this summer. Oh, great. Carol says, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Thanks for being here. Jay, appreciate you, man. Ran out of Presidente. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a problem, man. Katrina, and how, always. How's in the house? Always good to have you around. Not visible in the Bahamas. That's right. Sorry, man. 
Yeah, not here either. And how? And Good to you see got you to meet Hal, right? I did. Out, out there at Nightscaper. I'm so glad about that. I got to see him at the conference. And and also, Gabe and I bumped into him in a national park after that, too. Awesome. Uh, I Unfortunately, I probably stood in one of his photographs while he was like during a sunset. Sorry about that, Hal. But he shouted out and said, that's okay, Gabe and Matt. We're like, how do you know us? Oh, hey, Hal. How you doing? <laughs> so that was good well, bumping into Hal. No, knowing how he would forgive you. So. Oh, what a wonderful guy. What yeah. a wonderful, he had nice things to say about you too, Lance. Hmm. <laughs> Did he talk about, uh, mention something about a cemetery in West Texas? No. We spent a lot of time together in a cemetery. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, next time yeah. I bump into hell, I'm going to ask you about that. All right. And H Hadley, we're looking forward to seeing your, uh, your eclipse photo. Awesome. All right. Well, get out there, be fruitful, seize the night. And thanks for tuning in. If you're seeing this on, on the replay, drop us a line in the comments and let us know how you liked it. There will be no Instagram live this week. Uh, Gabe is taking the week off. He deserves it. Uh, but we will see you guys next week for more live content. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yep. Let's send any closing comments. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care, y'all. See you.